Hey everyone, this is Gary Kay, and I want to welcome you to an exciting launch and learn. Um, if you interact with universities, you sell to inner universities, support universities, you are a university, you want to have a relationship with the universities um, at any level, this is the launch and learn for you. And I, I can't imagine any integrator in the industry right now that's not focusing on uh, universities. We, you know, the university community, I'm here in my office here in the campus of the University of North Carolina. We are the first place that went back to normal. We were sort of for, uh, forced back to normal as quickly as possible. Uh, most university infrastructures aren't uh, aren't set up to deal with high flex and hybrid instructions. Unlike corporations where we're saying you have to come back to work with the universities, the students wanted to come back. Um, so there was a great opportunity to uh, to kind of become as close to normal as possible. And one thing that 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 uh, is is true about the university community is that there's a tremendous amount of streaming going on, and that is why we're doing this session. This how to engage students. Uh, content streamers and increased live production on college campuses specifically is going to be a big deal. Let me let me tell you why real quickly, and then I'm going to do a platform tour for those of you who are on launch right now. This is our launch and learn. We're coming to you live also on LinkedIn to try to grow our audience a little bit and, and reach out to people who may not have heard about this event. But um, those of you on launch get a few extra uh, goodies. Uh, but uh, first, think about this. Um, everyone wants to be able to stream um, or send classes to whatever platform they might use for, for lecture capture. Or maybe they even might use uh, Facebook or might use YouTube or something like that, right? That's one application. What about when you have a, a special guest on campus that's speaking in a large lecture hall and all of a sudden you have more people sign up for that uh, speaker uh, than you have seats in the room? Well, you have the ability to stream that content anywhere on campus. What about the athletic department, which is streaming both the Olympic sports and the big money-making sports, not just on campus, but out to the world. These are all use cases for engaging in streaming. And we have two experts that are gonna come on and be a part of my panel in just a bit. But first I wanna take you through a platform tour. Uh, the, the, to the right of the window that you're looking at me now, you'll actually see a Q&A little box, right? This gives you the ability to actually ask questions. You can actually tell me what you want me to ask them. Um, I'm not gonna, come up with all the great ideas uh, of questions to ask them. So I want to hear what you have to say. I want I want you to tell me what you want me to ask our guests and what you want to know about streaming. And there's a lot going on in streaming. Like streaming isn't just H.264, 265 like it used to be. There's all different levels. There's all different bandwidth. You've got new companies that have come out uh, with different platforms and technologies. I mean, look at all the stuff that's happened if you've been paying attention with NDI just in the last five years. They've been transforming the world in all different ways. Below me, you'll see some poll questions come up. We want to know what you think about what we're talking about. We'll ask you some random polls, and uh, and we want you to participate that way. If you don't want to participate in the Q&A, <clears throat> that's an easy way to participate, and it makes it a little bit more fun, and also gives us a little bit more data about what you're interested in. And then below that is networking. <clears throat> All of you who are on there live can interact with each other and can ask each other questions or even maybe ask me a question. You can post a question there, and I'll make sure uh, that my team will make sure that I get it. Um, so without further ado, I'd love to bring on our two guests, and I want to talk to you. Uh, uh, I want to talk to you all about the opportunity of streaming and sort of where we see the future of this market. First off, I want to welcome Jim Bass, uh, uh, Vice President of Marketing at Broadfield Distributing. Uh, Jim, why don't you introduce yourself and tell a little bit about what Broadfield does? Absolutely, Gary. I'd love to. Uh, Broadfield Distributing is a distributor, an authorized distributor for the VizRT systems, where Jeremy is going to be joining us in just a moment. And we have the opportunity to work with a lot of system integrators in the industry, uh, the same people that you talked about that are selling into the schools. And I've seen a lot of projects grow from an installation in a classroom to a department to an entire campus, even to multiple campuses and remote operations. So I want to share some of those stories that our integrators are experiencing today and some of the opportunities that we're seeing on streaming in the future. Perfect. I appreciate that introduction. I also want to introduce our uh, our, our second guest, uh, Jeremy Morris. Uh, Jeremy is with VizRT, as uh, Jim said. Uh, Jeremy, who is VizRT and, and what do you do? Thanks for the introduction and good seeing you again. Uh, yeah, so VizRT comes about from a ownership group that purchased New Tech almost five years ago. So that's how a lot of people have known me in the industry from before is being on the New Tech side of the world with the TriCaster. 
Well, VizRT acquired us, and then now we are now one big happy family under the VizRT umbrella. So that encompasses all of the high-end broadcast stuff from the graphic co uh, components, uh, the virtual uh, elements that you see a lot of the news, and then also what goes on in the traditional TriCaster world. So now we blend all of that together you know, around NDI as the ecosystem that kind of binds everything together. And I'm on the sales enablement side, workflow development, uh, product evangelist, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so I'm out there doing all the roadshows and webinars and things like that. Basically trying to discuss and talk about workflow and what you're trying to accomplish. Um, some of the things that we've evolved over the years is not just the technology you're, you're forcing to upgrade to that is what can the technology do for you as you adapt and you grow. So that we find a nice little happy medium in between. Sorry about that. I've been muting to talk to our producer. It's interesting sure. how um, this has evolved substantially over the last three years. I mean, as we were forced into uh, in, into uh, isolation, obviously streaming became a big deal and everyone had the ability to do it thanks to Zoom and Teams. Now we need to go to the next level. And what's interesting about universities is is that there's there's a lot of different opportunities here that exist. So let's let's kind of set it up a little bit because if you're a student going to class and you're able to make every single class live, kudos. Most of the time, people get sick. There's things that happen in your family. And then, of course, there's times where um, you know, have athletes in the class that are traveling um, and, uh, or maybe you're working on a class project. And in the old days, you'd have to miss class. But now we have the ability to stream that content live and even stream it into a lecture capture system uh, or some kind of a LMS platform that uh, learning, learning management system platform that can archive that content and we can accelerate that and, and explode that out using AI and some of the functionality that exists now. We can actually make that searchable through text search and through uh, voice search and things like that. That's the first application. Uh, next application is, is let's talk about um, bringing that content out beyond the students in the class. So you may have a guest speaker and you want to bring that guest speaker. We have a president of an advertising agency on campus uh, tomorrow, and we want that content to be streamed to all the classrooms uh, so that anyone has opportunity to, to meet with him. Um, obviously, streaming allows us to do that. We can do bi-directional streaming in and out of the classroom thanks to that technology. Then we have the athletic department, Jeremy, um, where the athletic department has a whole different application, right? They, they want to they may want to amp up the quality quite a bit because they're looking at sending it out to ESPN or sending it out to one of the broadcast networks or something like that. And then we have full on production, right? A lot of universities now have uh, radio, television, motion picture departments. They have production departments. They also have, um, you know, uh, where they might even have uh, um, uh, um, STEM departments, anything in STEM where you're um, where you have experts who might get interviewed by uh, any of the major networks and they need to be able to step into a studio kind of environment and be able to be guests anywhere. This is an opportunity. And I think what's interesting, Jeremy, and the, the point I want to make here is that I think that streaming sort of gets sort of left behind in that everyone builds a classroom or a educational facilities thinking about the use case of it in the traditional method, but they don't really think about it until after, hey, hey, by the way, can we, at the end of this project, could we also stream this to the classroom next door? Whereas if it's brought up front, there's a lot of opportunities to, it, and I doubt any in, in institution would say no to that if they knew how easy it was to do now, because we can use everything from a webcam to a professional broadcast camera, Jeremy. Well, and it's not just from the initial discussion or investment, especially with today's technology, the way you can grow and expand and scale after that first room. It's like, hey, we got something. Let's try this. Let's make this the one off. Can we make it work in this one environment, the lab environment? And then now we can scale it out. Well, the technology and the products allows that scalability a lot more cost effective. And so you can grow and add on parts and pieces as you need to. And with the whole streaming idea, it's not just I'm going to Facebook. It's like, well, the streaming is just the transport mechanism from point A to point B. If I'm going down the hall or to another room, that's just a local IP network. And so that also kind of changes the conversation with I'm not just doing a live stream. So that means Internet It's like, well, there's local area networks that we can take advantage of, too. And that also kind of you know, makes the IT department a little scared. It's like, well, wait a minute. What are we doing to our network? Well, we talk about isolation, getting that traffic to be segmented on various lanes. So I want the video you know, to run in a certain way and I want my regular campus data network to be on a different network. So now we're talking 
real tech inside the IT departments. And a lot of the budgets now are being driven by the IT department. So a lot of different uh, partners kind of have to play in the same sandbox here and understand what is the overall goal that you want to accomplish from the university side. And then what is the staff's requirements to make it happen locally? And then, you know, how with budget, how we're going to pay for it kind of a thing. And so that's just on the educational side. Then you move that over to like the sports or esports or things like that. Now we're sort of into a, a weird revenue generating area. When we talk about licensing rights for sporting events, uh, esports, and that, uh, that, <laughs> that whole growing market, there's a lot to talk about just in esports. We can go an hour just on that uh, and where that's going in the college university level. But now you can start to see how everybody can kind of play together nicely in, in one cohesive environment and you're scaling at different levels, but everyone's kind of working together. It's actually kind of cool to pull off. Yeah, and we are going to talk about esports because uh, there's not a university uh, in the country right now that's not either building an esports program or has a club on campus. And even in some cases, they're Division I uh, university programs. Um, we actually have an esports um, a live show that we do every couple of weeks, a couple of times a month we do it. Um, and where we talk about esports, not just in K through 12, but in higher education the direction that's going. And that's that's four different levels of streaming, which we'll get into in just a minute. Let's let's first talk. I, I want to kind of respond to what you just said, uh, Jeremy. And I want to pitch a question to Jim about that specifically, because I'm curious, Jim, um, at what point in the in the conversation do you enter most of the time when you're dealing with an integrator that's uh, working with the university or any kind of educational facility? Uh, you know. I know that ultimately the goal is to bring them in in the very beginning, but when do you, when do you come in right now generally and what would be best case scenario like where you're able to do the, the most support? So the best case scenario is that we have a great relationship with a lot of integrators all throughout the country and we're working with them as they start to design and spec out a project. But we know that best case scenario happens a very small percentage of the time. There's always the 80, 20 rule. For new integrators that are looking to get into the business, for schools that are reaching out to their AB integrators and saying, we're producing all of this great content, Gary, like you spoke about on the sports field or in esports. The more content you produce, the more you want to distribute that content to different places. You want to build the community that the school is basically creating a small town or city in some larger campuses. Uh, that's where they'll go to different integrators. It could be someone they worked with on an audio point of view. It could be an IT specialist. It could be a video specialist that now has to integrate all of these different components together. We have a line card that's over 30 different brands and 30 manufacturers. So we might take a TriCaster video production system and pair that with a Netgear AV switch to create an NDI routing environment that adds remote production capability and video distribution all over a campus. So as you start kind of asking the questions, what do we want to do with the content? That's a lot of times where what kind of equipment do I need becomes the next question. So, Okay. And that, that begs the question about Technology and bandwidth. So let's let's talk about that for just a second because I think when you know, especially if you went back five years ago, when you talk about putting video on a network, it freaked everyone out, right? And I think that's the the benefit of NDI. I think it still Jared. does. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it still does. You're right. You're right. You're right. Because it, it, you know, we obviously are concerned because it just takes up so much more bandwidth than anything else we're putting on the network right now. Jeremy, I want to ask you a question about because you got the NDI expertise. Like, where are we with that? I mean, it is you know, how do you overcome that fear and sort of what are the benefits of NDI, but also the benefits of, of being prepared and technologically, where are we right now with regard to most streaming on campus, swallowing bandwidth? Yeah, and I one thing I always try to get people to, to kind of check themselves a little bit and pump the brakes is anytime the, the phrase future-proof comes up, because nothing ever is. Uh, we've right. gone down that road many, many times. I, I remember those conversations back when I was an integrator about, oh, let's pull RG6 SDI cabling, that's future-proof. No, it's not. Uh, let's pull Cat 5e. That's future proof. No, it's not. Uh, let's pull multi-mode fiber. That's not future proof either. So, <laughs> a lot of that stuff kind of hinders where things have gone, especially now with current technology. Now we can get things onto a network, but a lot of basic infrastructure now has to be upgraded. So, do you have dark fiber? It's already pulled to different locations. A lot of people do because it was a lot easier back then to pull, you know, 40 extra strands just because you pull it once and you're done. 
So now you take advantage of the networks. Now we can mux signals onto a network. Let's get multiple different signals to flow on a dedicated network that's away from everything else. So that makes IT folks relax a little bit. Like I'm not going to take down the entire network. You know, going back to my college days with Napster and LimeWire and all the stuff, I won't get into what I got in trouble for. But <laughs> how you can take down a network by not paying attention or doing the right things. A lot of that stuff has been overcome, especially in the video world. You leverage NDI with the multiple different flavors and the different codecs that we're able to take advantage of and the different bandwidth bit rates that we're able to use, you know, 4K down to even 480. We've seen some schools do that just for like POV cameras or just confidence monitoring just to get a signal from one location to another because the, the infrastructure doesn't support it yet. Once they get the infrastructure upgraded, now we can take advantage of the cool stuff in 4K and whatnot. So we still can grow in that in that minefield <laughs> of IT. Um, and then also the connection points. When you realize that, hey, I've got an intramural field or a baseball stadium or somewhere else that's not directly on campus, how do I get from point A to point B? Well, you may not have fiber trunked under the ground all the way there. Now, what can we do over the air? There's some really cool technology advantages we can do just across you know, open public Wi-Fi now, uh, which has been kind of crazy to see that advancement over the last few years. Then there's other manufacturers out there as well that have the bonded cellular stuff that we can also deal with. So it, it really is moving at a breakneck speed almost on, on what's the next thing. But the cool part is we can still pull it off. We still have the capabilities. We play well with others. Uh, that's the other cool thing about our stuff. So it is a fun time. <laughs> yeah. And and so I'm curious about, I mean, a lot of the examples you just gave are through the uh, the athletic department and intramural and video and has found like its way at the very center the, the, of every it education well environment. That, right? I mean, in some cases, taking we learning have out of the classroom and enabling a whole ESPN, new generation we're supporting of storytellers. The local production teams. Um, and, and, I'm and also, we're teaching and production, right? this I mean, edition of Force Lake today. The future is with the kids, and, and, and the year that we have uh, fits is digitally routed great into our educational model of a great learning environment for students. Um, so that's part of it, right? You have remote high-level production cameras and, and lecture sometimes capture you do it distribution in the field with an iPhone, to student right? And you have to yep. join that to the network, and you have to marry those two qualities together. So it looks like it belongs together in the same broadcast. I know NDI has really simplified the transport of the, all of that and the connectivity and the compatibility of all that. Um, but ultimately, how do you decide? what to put where? How do you decide which kind of encoder goes where and what kind of ingest system goes where and, and um, you know, what kind of outputs that you use? And, and is it all based on how it's going to be watched in a particular room or is it based on the content, input content and the quality of the content we're, we're dealing with? Because, I, I mean, obviously, I know a basketball game, we got to have the highest quality possible, but not for an intramural football game. Right. And, and my answer would be all of the above. Um, mainly because NDI is the only true bi-directional video over IP protocol that's out there, which means the edge devices can be both sources and destinations simultaneously, or either or at a given moment. So if I'm pulling four signals back from one location and sending two, okay, that's fine for the first hour. Then later that afternoon, I'm doing something completely different over the exact same network in the exact same boxes, but the signals are going different directions. We're able to do that and leverage that using the NDI technology. So then that alleviates some of those concerns of one-way transmission. We can move things around a lot more easily through a network that way. And yeah, it kind of makes your brain lock up a little bit. Uh, it took me quite a while coming but, back. But can they use the network that exists on campus? Like, how do you know what's the minimum that you need? And ultimately, how do you make a decision on what to upgrade, what part of campus is to upgrade? And yeah, where are so going to be the stumbling blocks? When you're talking about cameras and things like that, um, especially a lot of the PTZs are leveraging the HX protocol, which is a little more compressed, but at least get you that multiple signals on one network type bandwidth management uh, application. So instead of being, you know, full on 4K at, you know, 260 or whatever meg, I'm down in around the 30 to 80 range, depending on the camera manufacturer. So then I, that allows me more signals on a traditional gigabit network. And for the vast majority of times, that's all you really need. Um, so then it becomes, and especially in a, a flexible environment, what am I broadcasting from? And then do I need to send in the returns back? Uh, we've seen a lot of this, you know, not just talk about sports, but in lecture halls, when people move things around for that, or like you mentioned before, having some a guest speaker come on that might need more than what's currently in available in that room right now. Well, with network jacks that are already available on the wall, we can take advantage of plugging in either an encoder or a decoder. Uh, in some instances, we've got devices that are both bi-directional. So then I can send 
you know, the transmit from the presentation back through the system, but also get a return feed come back so they can actually watch what's going on live right in front of them. If they have a confidence monitor or something that yeah, they're to, on stage. To, to make sure that what they think they're, that they're recording or seeing is what they think they're right. Or if they're bringing to. someone in remotely. Yeah. So if we're trying to do this exact same call in a lecture hall where we need to have live audience participation, we still have to be able to move signals back and forth from the on-prem to the remote and then back again so everyone kind of sees what's going on. So if you think back in the old distance learning days, when they roll in those massive machines and massive monitors and you're taking up most of the you know the, the school's uh, phone system <laughs> to, yeah. to pull this off, you know we've simplified this quite a bit on the network. And then we've reduced a lot of that overhead from the bandwidth using the codex, using the capabilities. Yes, it's a little bit more compressed, but it you don't really need uncompressed video to do you know a town hall like this. When we get to the sporting applications, you might want to have higher bit hand bit or higher bandwidth, higher bit range, and signal quality you know for those types of high profile events. Um, so then it becomes load management. What makes the most sense to that IT individual? And we have those conversations. I mean that's why I'm around to flush out that workflow up front so we understand what parts and pieces do we need where, what's currently available on site, and then where do we need to augment and add as things move forward? All right, so Jim, I'm gonna ask you a key question here because um, the network keeps getting mentioned over and over and over again. And I know that Netgear has a set of AV switches specifically for this kind of stuff, but I'm gonna guess that most universities don't have those switches. So when do they got to go to those? And what's the advantage of using the Netgear AV uh, switches that are out there? And before I, before I get you to answer that question, I want to pop up a, an image of a, an ebook. I'm going to show you some ebooks uh, and over the course of the next uh, 30 minutes um, that are free. Uh, VizRT offers one on empowering education, specifically like, kind of like a little bit of everything you need to know about uh, streaming in a in a K through 12, and even a uni- I mean a university, but even a K through 12 campus, if if they've got the money, obviously that's obviously always a budget concern about how much we're going to do in K through 12, but not a need concern. They have athletic events, they have um, the same kind of needs that uh, university have. But Jim, I want to ask you first about the network question, because at what point in time do you have to change your network? He, uh, Jeremy, literally just said one gig, one gig, one gig. Uh, but I also know that there's going to be times where you want more than one gig when you're maybe sending it out to ESPN. But what if I've got existing Cisco switches, I've got existing other switches, when do I have to step up? Well, you know, it really depends on what the application is. If you are running a production environment like a sporting event, like the school auditorium and the theater productions, setting up a dedicated production system is always going to be the best practice. All we're doing in the case of an AV over IP is using cat sits cabling as opposed to your traditional SDI wires. Now we create that dedicated production system with something like the Netgear switch that gives you a GUI that lets you configure every port to be a full bandwidth NDI camera, an NDI HX camera, a Dante AV audio source, you know, uh, it, it's important, I'll point out, that VizRT also owns NDI technology. But that NDI technology is available and open sourced to a lot of different brands out there that are integrated into their cameras. But when we talk about AV over IP, you're not solely dedicated to using NDI with a TriCaster. TriCaster supports all different protocols as does NDI supporting uh, all different ways of getting the video from one system to a, from a camera to a production system to a converter and everywhere else. So now once you configure your installation, you configure your production system, you have your switch, now you can determine how do I get that onto the network? How do I share it across the campus? How do I reach it to my audience? We've all been to a campus, and I'm sure you you see it all over the place in Charlotte, where everyone's walking around streaming something on their phone. That's going out to the public internet, and now they have the ability to stream whatever you're broadcasting. Yep. Or I could stream it in like a digital signage protocol where I could take an NDI source and put it on a display in the entranceway. So now when people come to visit my campus, they're seeing what's happening live in the auditorium or on the sporting uh, field or or even the student broadcast anywhere throughout it. So it gives you a lot of different flexibility and a lot of different things to do. 
And interestingly enough, VizRT actually has an educational ebook that kind of covers a little bit about everything on a mm -hmm. college campus as well. Um, I want to pop that up here right now. This is a, an ebook that you put together, Campus Technology Game Changer ebook. It talks a little bit about sort of all the things that you need to watch out. All these are, by the way, free and all available on the site below. If you're on launch.com right now, L A V N C H dot com, all of those are, are below and uh, you can. You can download those or you can, of course, go to the VizRT website or just Google them. You'll find them there. Um, I want to turn my attention to some tech questions. I hope that you don't mind, Jeremy. I want to know about, uh, you know, what are our limitations with regard to, um, you know, cameras and you know, limitations with regard to color imagery and what trade-offs are we making at different res at different uh, bandwidths? I mean, you you talked about one gig. I mean, one gig is what's on, you know, certainly every college campus has one gig. I don't think that's going to be a problem. That I know will handle lecture capture. I know that'll handle sending uh, a speaker from one room to the other. That'll also handle um, any kind of hybrid or high flex learning environment, handle learning management system. All that's going to be one gig. But where are our limitations with regard to selecting all the other third party components out there? Not, I mean, obviously, VizRT has everything handled with regard to the to the encoders and decoders, right? The on-ramps and off-ramps. But, mm -hmm. but what about when I'm selecting cameras? What about microphones? I have to worry about compatibility there. What about all the other gear that's part of this uh, ecosystem? Right. So go back to one of my earlier statements that, in fact, we play well with others. That also works on the network and the fact that we can live in you know, NDI and Dante can actually coexist on the same you know, subnets and even the same infrastructure. And a lot of times, there's some times where it does get quirky and we talk about that and we work through those workflows to make sure that everything works fine. But yeah, we talk about number of cameras on a network. You're talking about connectivity from the camera that's on me right now, which is our NDI 4K camera is, is on a Cat6 line to my network switch that's feeding into all this, all the you know nonsense I have going on here in my shed. Um, but that's one gig connection to the switch. And then if you've got multiple switches or from the switch going back out, then you can start talking about trunking and the need for 10 gig or even higher when you deal with all those signals going back from one location to another. For the most part, all the edge devices are the one gig. And that's where that takes up. And even that is not the whole lot on that network. The camera that's on me right now is only going to be you know, in the 20 to 30 meg worst case in 4K. So I'm not too worried uh, about that load coming from the camera side. When it gets into the TriCaster, for instance, we, I mean, we do leverage some things to ourselves when it comes to the, the world of NDI. You know, we do have the low-res proxy capability, so I don't have to have full bandwidth of all signals live at one given moment. But I do have a 10 gig and a 1 gig NIC usually, depending on which TriCaster model you're dealing with, when I need to have more than 8 or 16 or 32 or even 44 sources then yes, we do leverage a 10 gig connection just to make sure we've got tons of availability on that network from all those sources coming at the same time. But again, it comes down to how we manage that bandwidth when we're talking about tons of signals. I mean, we've got a, a lot of use cases. I mean, there's a, a place over in Europe, there's a channel that has over 700 NDI sources at a given wow. moment that's live on the network. Wow. That just comes down to deployment. How are you going to talk about it up front? We need to have this many sources going to these many destinations. Okay, let's plan out the network topology. And for the most part, it's just scalability once you get to that point. Um, the flow is all just managed internally. So we can definitely leverage all of that. And we talk about microphones, edge devices, converters. We do have our Sparks. Um, there's third-party manufacturers that have you know similar devices as ours as well. But that's the kind of glue about NDI being a protocol rather than a standard is you have to follow the rules that everyone else ascribes to. So then you do run into true plug-and-play environments. And that's really cool sometimes especially for integrators that are, you know, learning NDI, you, know, you can go through the NDI course. We have that at bizrtuniversity.com uh, or leverage other manufacturers knowledge on that ecosystem and have these devices talk to each other. And that's really cool as well. So that pops up on the network. Hey, I can see that these are from completely different manufacturers, but we're all talking the same language. And so we can move signals around very easily and that becomes a very, easy to scale as well. Now I start adding more parts and pieces as necessary without having to rip everything out and start over from scratch. Yeah. So um, I want to talk, um, probably the most popular application on a college campus default that if you want a way to get into the door is, is um, lecture capture. I mean, like everyone's doing lecture capture. Everyone's putting it somewhere, whether they're, I mean, they could even be using Zoom and Teams nowadays, mostly Zoom probably. 
to do that kind of stuff. But ultimately, we then want to have it reside on whatever learning management system that we're using. Some use Blackboard, some use Sakai, some use Canvas, and some of them use Panopto and some of the other recording platforms that are out there. That has to be simple, though. The truth of the matter is, Jim, the professors that come into these classrooms, they don't know how to use this stuff. They just want to be able to press a button. The room starts up. They want to be able to plug in their laptop, and they want it to be totally seamless. Your your uh, lecture capture ebook is great at that because it tell it shows not only how uh, the VizRT, I should say, lecture capture book is great on that because it shows not only how to do this but also talks about the simplicity of this. Jim, this is this is like the whole low hanging fruit if you're an integrator to get into the yeah. university community. Would you not agree? Oh, absolutely. You know, there are three critical elements when we talk about lecture capture. It's scheduling, it's automation, and it's recording. When you can create the schedule, like every college campus across the country runs on a schedule. Yeah, Monday, Wednesday, the students this, know when to be yeah, yeah. <laughs> The capture system has to know when to start capturing. And when you can create that automation, you can create the schedule. Now, all the integrator is doing is setting up the equipment, integrating that with the CMS platform, taking the product like the BizRT Capture Cast, integrating this all together into these applications, and you're off and running. And this is where, Gary, when I was talking about earlier, where we've seen the deployment quickly grow from a classroom to a department to a campus, this is exactly what we're talking about. It's one of those things like, why don't I have that? I want that too. <laughs> <laughs> then the only thing you have to add to that is going outside the classroom. Like, how do I get, if I'm, uh, you know, in, in the, in the quad, I'm down in the intramural fields mm -hmm. and I want to do a live broadcast for a local uh, campus news station that maybe the students have put together, or for that matter, for the school newspaper and the productions that they're doing. That's all we got to do then. And then we, we leverage Wi-Fi from there. That's, that's a low-hanging fruit. But let's talk about some of the bigger projects. I want to talk about eSports because this is a great opportunity. So eSports is interesting. I've learned a lot about eSports over the last five years because I've really gotten interested in this. And we put in an eSports venue here at UNC. And, and uh, there's probably 40 universities that have substantial eSports uh, programs now with another 200 coming right behind it. Last year's Infocom, there was an eSports pavilion on the show site. That uh, On the show floor, there's going to be a much larger one at Infocom 2024. If you haven't thought about registering for that show, by the way, infocom.org, um, go re infocomshow.org, uh, go register for it. Um, you can use our code RAVE, R-A-V-E, and get free uh, entry into this show. The, um, the eSports venue is kind of interesting because – you have four different systems running at the same time. So it's like, it's like the Holy grail for an in integrator, right? Cause you get to learn a lot doing esports, right? Yeah. You have, you have um, ultimately you have a full on live production system, right? Where you use an, I, I want you to talk about Jeremy, what, you know, what stuff you got to use for each one of these. Cause I certainly know how to build a production system, but I don't know that I necessarily how to build one for esports because esports is quite unique in that it is truly real time, right? I mean, for the players themselves, there's no delay, right? But then we're also right. sending that out to now ESPN has their own esports channel and you have all sorts of other networks there. That's the first thing. So then you have the, the, the you have the judges slash referees. They have a separate feed, right? They see, and they get to see, uh, they don't just see what the players are seeing. They see what the players are seeing. They see what the audience is seeing and they see the perspective POV from the players mm -hmm. position as well. And that's all in one feed. Right. We have the, by the way, we have the POV feed as well, which a camera over every single player. So you can see what they're singing as well. In addition right. to the live feed of the actual content coming from the computers, the audience, however, is seeing a delayed feed, which is very interesting. A lot of people don't, like you go to a basketball game, football game, you're seeing the action live. The audience right. at esports is actually seeing a delay of anywhere from 20 seconds to two minutes, depending on which game platform rules that they're playing. Right. Each, you know, every, Every gaming system has their own sort of rules for an esports tournament, right? Mm -hmm. We also then have the stream out to the uh, to Twitch or YouTube or wherever we're streaming there. It's it's like the holy grail for an uh, integrator because you get to learn a little bit about everything, but it's all connected to one system, all using the same cameras. How right, do you pull yeah. that off, Jeremy? So that that goes back to you know the <laughs> the, the horsepower built under the hood of NDI and what we can leverage to do that, you know, on the software component versus the hardware component and how they can still talk to each other. When you're dealing with some of that high res, high refresh rate gaming action using the software versions of NDI, we can extract that 
at that refresh rate so we don't so does that it. software no. live on the each of the game players themselves or where does that live on the, yes on the gaming pcs yes we're extracting that so we're bringing that in because you get some you in some funky resolutions and refresh rates that aren't your traditional av or broadcast standards and so we've got to be able to, to massage that and deal with that and that goes back to ndi being frame rate and resolution agnostic we can kind of help that along the path and get that into a broadcast production environment uh, and so then that way we can actually scale and on the frame sync and whatnot. So everything is kind of matched up, you know, video for video. So the game players, you know, they're playing each other. They really don't care about everything else that's going on. They don't need to. But like you said, once it gets into the production environment, I'm doing a couple of different things. I'm switching for the live that's feeding back into Twitch or whatnot. I'm getting the feeds going over for the shoutcasters so they can call out, but that's the announcer side of it. So that doesn't really affect, you know, the gaming action. And then like you mentioned, the, the referees and the judges when it comes to the tournament time, they see their own feeds. So that's kind of like when you deal with, with sports and replay. A lot of these gaming applications have built-in replay feature set. That's part of the game itself. Others, we're taking all of those feeds and putting them into our replay system to then make that available to everyone. That also allows your productions to scale because a lot of these colleges and universities, they're not going for the big side of esports yet. They're starting small. They're just doing the basic stuff. They're getting their feet wet, understanding here's how I can work on my esports program you know, before I go up to the big times, we've seen that actually work very, very well as they decide to scale up their production, not just from a gameplay, but now I'm building curriculum around it. You know, we're dealing with the graphic designers that are that are helping with not only the game action or building their own games, but also dealing with the graphic aspect for going out live. So they're building the content around the esports, and then you get the flashing lower thirds, the stats, everything else. We can take all that telemetry data, build that graphic content, and now you have a full-on finished production that looks very, very cool. And it's customized not only to the game, but also to the university or even the the, the conference if they're doing a conference tournament. So we can kind of handle all that. And then, like you said, the distribution going out to the viewers that are there either in that stadium or like around the, the facility. Uh, so now they can follow along. If there's a green room, if you've got multiple different teams that are playing at different times, if they want to watch that game match and we can handle that uh, distributed content going out, that's either like what we could just call the like, traditional clean feed. So there's no all that telemetry data and it's not the heavily delayed Twitch return. Um, I, I even deal with this in House of Worship where I'm watching the live stream of church yeah. to make sure my audio is OK. And that's like a 45 second delay because I have to go up and back down again. Yeah. So we can kind of do a localized distribution of that content so that way you're close to live action so when you hear the crowd roar you know okay that's exactly what just happened yeah J uh, jim i want to ask you to respond to that because i'm curious broadfield um obviously you know you got viz rt handled but what about all the other gear that's part of this when you're talking about a, an esports or for that matter even electric capture environment or or you know they're you know campus-wide um, what part of the ecosystem do you play in, obviously? And, and you know, how do you support, you know, do you have the, do you, do you have the, the team that can help support a, uh, an integrator in their first build of an esports pavilion as an example, or how would you handle that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I have to laugh because you said that esports is the holy grail to integrators. And I have a lot of integrators who might say, I don't know about the Holy Grail, because <laughs> it possesses a lot of the biggest challenges for yeah. them. Uh, where I think it is the Meaning Holy it's Grail difficult. is that they know they're not the phone calls. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they'll get the phone calls for sure. Uh, <laughs> this is where uh, gaming, more than anything else in the world, will test all of the system requirements. You need the CPU, you need the GPU, you know you need the bandwidth. So having the experienced integrator to kind of hold their hand through the campus and help set this up is really important for them. One of the things we've done is we've invested in a sales engineering team that has worked with integrators to spec out some of these systems where now we can take the marriage of all of our brands together and take the VizRT TriCaster system and the three play systems and know how they serve each of the different components that you were talking about. Compare those with a Killaview converter or a Panasonic PTZ camera, a handheld camcorder that has NDI, uh, a Denekia switches, which we talked a lot about. So there's a lot of different components that are going to be required to set up these arenas to make sure that you can get your in-game play, get your conference play, get your broadcast out to the rest of the campus, 
uh, these are all different challenges that are going to come up along the way. You know, um, I want to kind of shout out to Jeremy. You guys have some great eBooks, by the way. And you, and you have one, um, I know there's one coming on. I don't think you have one yet on the Butler uh, integration. Yet. Case studies published on it. Yeah. It is, is the case study is published now. Yes, it's, um, it's on a, a couple different sites um, okay. that talked about that. But yeah, uh, last year. But I want to ask first. you about that because that's a pretty substantial install. But first, I want to show one of the case studies you have from Cranfield University um, uh, and their use of NDI uh, campus-wide in different applications that talks about both lecture capture as well as production application on campus. I like your, your case studies and how you kind of tie it all together. And I think case studies are a really good way for you to kind of dabble in this and kind of get to, uh, to know what's going on. So I'd encourage you to go to v, uh, vizrt.com to see some of these. I didn't know the Butler one was published. So I want to talk about Butler for just a second. I want you to talk about that integration because they're also talking about this can be a revenue generating thing for them, not just a, an application on campus. Uh, Cause I think that is another way to look at this, that, that once you put in the ability to send content anywhere, you can use that facility for almost mm -hmm. anything. It becomes a conference facility. It becomes, a, it becomes even a trade show venue, potentially, Jeremy. Talk about Butler and what they're doing. Yeah. So, yeah, Butler uh, launched their eSports arena. Uh, last year, they hosted the Big East tournament there, and that was done through the, you know, the TriCaster system uh, for production, uh, distribution, also for the free play. And then there's other facilities very similar like this that I've been engaged with that are talking about, you know, rentaling, rental and revenue generating from that location. Um, so there's a few other schools that are out there that are doing it. They're allowing other like local regional gamers to come in and use their facility that they built out for their own teams and their own programs. Yeah, because they're not using it 24 hours a day. Right, exactly. So and it's a drop in, in literally completely outfitted drop in setup that is super expensive if you want to put this on yourself right? For a high school to do, right? right yeah. in, in Butler, Indiana, there's a lot of, of uh, high school. Yeah, in Indianapolis, there's, yep. Yeah, yeah, so, but, and, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, sorry. Um, yeah, there's other schools that are doing this as well. Uh, like you talked about, the local email for the high school, bringing those, those programs up, because we see this now in high schools as well. They're starting to build out their own facilities. And so now we provide this path where they can go from, even from a recruitment standpoint, it's like, hey, I have the local talent already in town. They're already used to not only the gameplay, but being in that environment. So when you've got students that are know how and how to play, not just the game, but to perform in that arena environment, because that could be kind of challenging. You're used to playing games at home. Now I'm inside this arena, you know, in like a sporting event, like you normally for basketball or whatever, or what's well, even funny is like in Vegas, they turn a lot of the boxing arenas into esports pavilions as well. Uh, they utilize those spaces for this emerging technology. Uh, so now you've got a lot more eyes on your facility than before. A lot of students may not have even considered your univers university before. Now they will because they're interested in the esports program because they're already invested in their own high schools. So that does allow that path to move up. And then they can take advantage, not just the students being there, but then also the revenue generating on the outs outside of it of clubs and other sporting events that are utilizing your facility. So it does help <laughs> in getting that uh, facility pitched in the first place if you don't have one. All right. So, Jim, I want to... Um... You know, I want to make sure we have a chance to cover this because there's going to be a lot of people on here, both end users as well as integrators that are going to ask probably the same question. Where do I get started? Uh, do you have a team that that's what they that's what they do, Jim, or wh what do I do? We do. We are, so first of all, we have a great relationship with VizRT and the other brands that we talked about. So when a case study like this gets published, we take that case study, we kind of break down the equipment there. We talk to our integrators who are working with the schools. Sometimes we'll just create a call like this and we'll set up a party line and say, let's talk this out. Let's figure out what we need. Uh, I know I can get Jeremy to join us on one of these calls or <laughs> any other of the uh, territory managers throughout VizRT. And we can really break down kind of the needs for how to set these things up and figure out what the equipment looks like and get the quote. And if a school reached out to us directly, we would loop in the integrator that they might already have a relationship or introduce them to one in that area. If a new integrator is watching us today and they have a relationship with a school and maybe they're not doing the video side of it, we can help introduce the TriCaster to them, get them set up with the training and certification that they need to take advantage of this technology and, and do all of that together. 
Well, Je- uh, Jeremy, you are um, kind of an NDI God. Uh, if people kind of do some research on you, they'll mm-hmm. realize that uh, you are like an NDI God for lack of a better term. <laughs> and I, and I, you know, obviously boy, has that come a long way in the last 10, I mean, 10, 10 years to now. I mean, it's, it's surprisingly substantial, but yeah. it, even in the last five years, but NDI is obviously uh, even it's not finished. It's, it's evolving. And it, and at the NAB this upcoming year, uh, in just a couple of months, there's going to be a new version of NDI. How do you keep track of all that and make sure you have all that compatibility and all? I mean, like, you know, obviously, maybe you have some insight there because you know what's coming. But but at the same time, you know, you're in, playing in a space that is totally emerging. So if I'm making a big investment, how do I know that I'm not going to have to make that big investment again three years from now? So, yes, uh, evangelist, I prefer that phrase rather than the God. You know, I, I, I leave that to the God in general. Um, but coming back from those conversations like what Jim was talking about with the colleges and universities, that's what happened with Butler because I actually am a Butler alum. So that helped with that conversation to spur that conversation along and get that production uh, under underway to get that big vision from the end users. And just like we do that with everybody else. And we talk about that technology, not to scare them off or think, hey, I have to spend a whole lot of money on the technology in general. The fact that NDI constantly is changing and upgrading and perfecting itself over the years allows the technology to grow without the additional expense. And we do have that backwards capability where if I have an older camera that's still outputting, you know, the HX1 protocol, which was that early, early adopt one for a lot of the third party camera stuff we can still use that in a modern TriCaster. Is it because we add that backwards compatibility into it? The new flavors just unlocks extra horsepower. Now you might get to a situation eventually where your five or 10 year old system can't utilize the new bells and whistles just because your existing hardware just can't, it's not possible. You know, then we talk about the trade in the trade up credits and the options there. But when it comes to NDI six, that's the latest flavor that will be coming out at NAB. There are some things I've already been talked about publicly about the capabilities behind it. Uh, and again, it's a protocol. So what can we do inside the rules that are established from that SDK? Everyone can kind of read through it and see what's going on. The existing one that's already out there. And that can, that can kind of give you that primer and understanding is like, okay, where's that technology actually going? The fact that it's been bi-directional since day one helps in that conversation when it comes to software when it comes to hardware on the software side a lot i mean we give a lot away uh for the software developers to really have a lot of fun and play with we also have an advanced sdk in the ndi world and some of the folks there over at the ndi division and again we are kind of separate in that we got the visit group and then we got the ndi group um you can do some real dark deep dives you know get really really nerdy <laughs> on that tech uh, with those guys to really advance what you're trying to develop yourselves. That also goes back to, you know, the esports, the lecture capture and the third party integration, because we get kind of give you the keys to the kingdom already and the software side of it. So yes, all the hardware and individual parts and pieces that you're buying already can communicate, but now we give you some tool sets to enhance that yourself. Uh, and that can be really powerful for a lot of individuals creating your own custom interfaces your custom NDI routing control, third-party integration. Uh, We do that a lot. Go back to even on the CapturCast side with our open API, what we can talk about from the scheduling and the automation. We do play well with others. I say that a lot in all my workflow discussion because nobody makes everything. You're going to have to talk to somebody else or something at some point. Now, how do you do that? How do you leverage that? We have a lot of skill set internally at our company. Uh, A lot of really, really smart folks, uh, even smarter than me that know how to do all this stuff. I lean on them a lot. So that makes you look a lot smarter on camera. So my hat's off to those guys. And it's just, it comes down to what do you want to do? And then it's really, really hard for me to get to a no because there's so many different ways we can do this and tackle this with our products and with our technology. So I want to, I want to compare. um, One of the questions that came in was, this isn't exactly AV over IP, but in a way it is AV over IP. Like there's, there's different mm-hmm. levels, right? I mean, obviously. Well, it's AV and broadcast over IP together. Yeah. yeah. And so, but, but, but then we also have the real time application inside of a classroom mm-hmm. where we're just hooking up a laptop and showing um, slides inside of a, a classroom. Um, that part of AV over IP, <clears throat> where does NDI fit into this? And uh, ultimately, where where is it best suited? What parts of AV over IP? 
So we have a lot of hybrid environments. Um, I've even had conversations with the folks like at STVOE and a few other mm -hmm. uh, manufacturers going back to my dealer days. I still have all those friends and, and all those connections. And so we still talk about how we can make this work um, in the traditional AV sense. You know, we have the HDMI encode decoders getting in that into an AV matrix on the HDMI side and then be able to bring it back out on the broadcast side. We can kind of commingle and live together, even though the worlds are kind of separate. We talk about in-room distribution and then yeah. what those signals are going out. Then we attack on, like for the capture cast, for instance, where I can take the NDI signals in for just the signal aggregation, but where are those signals coming from? So then we have the you know the demarcation of I take the AV matrix, come out HDMI, decode that into or encode that into a spark on the NDI side, get that into the NDI ecosystem. Now everything still lives the way it was. We didn't change anything. We just took advantage of an output to feed the other system. So we can kind of prevent everyone from ripping everything out at once and start over. We can still take advantage of what's currently there without doing the massive disruption to the ecosystem. Yeah. And Broadfield obviously can support all that. Jim, if I'm interested in uh, developing a relationship with you, how do I get in touch with your team over at Broadfield? Uh, you can go to our website at broadfield.com. You can give us a call at 800-634-5178. Uh, you can reach out to us through any of those channels. Uh, we're actually broadcasting today from our own NDI studio. We've used a lot of the same NDI tools that Jeremy's talking about. Uh, the beauty of the VizRT system is that they make the hardware and the software components and everything working together, uh, even in the classroom, in the AV over IP. You could use NDI tools to send a PowerPoint presentation right from a laptop. And once you set up the NDI network, uh, it really gives you a ton of that flexibility for your content, uh, both in the classroom, outside the classroom, remote production, and everything else in between. And, and we can help answer some of those questions and address some of those challenges as they come up, for sure. All right, so everyone watching, first off, Jeremy, thank you very much for joining us uh, live from VizRT. You can learn more about VizRT at VizRT.com. And of course, NDI is at NDI.io, I think now. Uh, NDI.video. Or dot video. Okay. I knew yeah. it was something a little different. Yeah. Um, if you're interested in the, the technology um, and broadfield.com. So um, what we're going to do with this recording is we're going to wrap. I know a lot of you are, are asking about what we're going to do with this and how do you get those eBooks and stuff. If you go to launch.com, L-A-V-N-C-H.com, even after this event, you can actually go register and you'll actually have access to all of this. And if you go to the page, all of these eBooks are, are linked on that page. In addition to this video will be wrapped up there. Um, if you're on LinkedIn right now, it, LinkedIn actually automatically wraps this up and saves it on my uh, LinkedIn feed all, as well as uh, Ray Pub's LinkedIn feed. Um, so you could actually reference that and have some people back to that as well. Um, but both these guys have invited you to, to uh, contact them directly. And of course, they're also available on LinkedIn. If you go to launch.com and go to this page that you're on, or if you're on there now, if you click their names, it'll take you directly to their LinkedIn profile so you can connect with them. Jeremy, thank you very much for joining us today. I appreciate the, the wealth of knowledge that you bring. Uh, Jim, I appreciate this. I think this is um, you know, a great launching pad for a lot more to come. I mean, there's a lot going on out there that's changing very rapidly, especially if we look at sort of the way the world has changed. And the fact that we're having to accommodate all different environments, not just on a university campus, but in a corporate environment and, uh, and everywhere else. So I think we're going to hear more about streaming and more about connecting people together and sending content through a network for that matter in the future. I think that's going to be a bigger discussion as we move forward. I want to thank everyone for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion. Um, this is not something we get to do a lot and uh, love doing these kind of things. They're educational, but also informative. At the same time, if if you stumbled upon this and you want to, again, see the entire recording from the very beginning, or you want to forward this to someone else to watch in, inside of your team, somebody who might be interested in streaming, all you have to do is go to launch.com, L-A-V-N-C-H.com, and log in, yeah. and you'll have access to all of our on-demand programs, including this one. Um, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate it. Uh, Jim, you have a great day. Jeremy, have a great day. And all of you who participate in this, we really appreciate you you joining us today and thanks to our producer Carrie and I'll say thanks, goodbye Carrie. for the day. Thanks.